Welcome into K State Online. I'm Mason Both. That is Derek Young, a Friday KSO show for you. And as promised, even though uh, movie magic people, we are rec- recording this on the same day as the other. Derek, as promised, is wearing his Penn State shirt. So we are. Yeah, we we are. That is a, a powerful statement right there. Kind of a scary looking shirt. Uh, I don't know if it's scary or cool or both, but uh, it fits the bill for both of those. That's Derek Young. I'm Mason Voth, and it's a good time to remind you that you can join your Wildcats in Ireland as they kick off the 2025 football season against Iowa State and the Aer Lingus College Football Classic. Game tickets can be secured now through a travel or hospitality package. All-inclusive travel packages include premium game tickets, luxury hotel accommodations, an exclusive K-State welcome experience, and more. Game day hospitality packages include premium in-stadium hospitality with food and drinks and premium game tickets. Don't miss out on the trip of a lifetime. Book your package now at cats2ireland.com. That's cats, the number two, ireland.com. All right, it is a bye week for K-State, which uh, it's a good time to talk about where the Wildcats sit. They will get one other bye week over the course of this season. It will come after their first game played in November. So they'll go to Houston, then they will have a bye week, return home, and then they will play Cincinnati, Arizona State, and then road game at Iowa State to close things out. Through the first five games of the season, the Cats 4-1, and 1-1 one, one and one in Big 12 play. If I had told you that K-State was 4-1 and 1-1 one and one and one at the start of the season after five games, would you have taken it, or would you have said, ah, that sounds like there's a disappointing loss somewhere in there? It's funny. I think I would have taken it and imagined it would have been to Oklahoma State and because Oklahoma State was really good. So, you know, context matters here. Perspective matters. You say before the season. Before the season, I think we were expecting a much better version of Oklahoma State than we saw and have seen. Yeah. Hey, you know, to me, I obviously I thought I looked at the schedule and said, I think K-State's better than all these teams that they're going to play or I like the situation better. Um, this is probably like a lot of things where sports, no matter which ones they are, you might get to the same result by the end, but the process is never how you anticipate it to be. And that in all likelihood is probably how K-State's season sits right now, where Four and one is not the craziest thing to have said uh, with how they would have started the year, but I think going into it, a lot of people would have said eh, probably a loss to Arizona or Oklahoma State, not BYU. But knowing what we know now, it kind of makes sense. And again, I don't know that BYU is anything special. I just think K State had some unfortunate things happen to them, and they were not mature enough to handle those things happening in that moment. They had to learn and kind of grow up in Provo when they they took their lumps there. Thinking about them sitting at 4-1 and one right now and the way the rest of the Big 12 has played out, because I think at this point in time, really the only conversation that matters about K-State football and what constitutes a success of this season is getting to Arlington in the first place. Is K-State still on track to be one of the two teams to play in Arlington, in your opinion? Well, that's a good question. I almost say yes without a whole lot of thought, just because a lot of the teams at the top, maybe along with K-State, are playing at a level below what I would have anticipated, or at least that the general consensus was. Arizona, I kind of anticipated some growing pains, but most people thought they were a top six or top seven team. I think Kansas State's better than Arizona. Oklahoma State, I've already mentioned, they are far worse than I thought they would be. Kansas is already have what they're one and four, right? I mean, no one expected them to be one and four. I'm, Utah has a loss already, and they lost at home, which mm-hmm. they're supposed to be basically flawless at home. And their future is a little murky because of the status of Cam Rising going forward. And some of that is their own doing. If they would just tell us when he was going to be available. Now I get they they like the dog and pony show that Bill Snyder likes. Yeah, I was gonna say it's very Bill Snyder esque. Oh, he might play. He might play. But if you told me, hey, Utah told me Cam Rising was going to be back 
this upcoming week, I'm like, okay, they're probably the favorites. But I don't know. Like, <laughs> they, 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 if said he's questionable for like two weeks already, he warms up and then doesn't play. And he's been warm enough for two. I don't know. That, that situation is murky. UCF just got stomped at home by Colorado. Now there's a few teams better than I thought they would be, but are they better than Kansas State? I don't. I don't think so. Even and BYU fans, just cover your ears. Yes, you're undefeated. Yes, you beat Kansas State by 29 points. I don't think you're better than Kansas State, even to this day. Colorado's had a really. They've had a good season that is probably better than what we all thought they would have to this point. I don't think they're better than Kansas State. They might beat Kansas State because they get them in a good spot in a home game and night game where Boulder is going to be on fire. But I don't think, you know, so all that makes me like Kansas State is one of the top two teams headed to Arlington. But, and, and I think the betting markets kind of are that way too, if I if I remember correctly. I know those are, are kind of fluctuating. But right now, I I think there is a gap after the top three teams. I'm going to, for some reason, still give Utah the benefit of the doubt because even without Cam Rising, they were pretty good the week before. Now, without him, they were pretty bad against Arizona. I get But I'll say Utah, and I'll say K-State, and I'll say Iowa State, and I think the gap is after those three. Yeah, it's 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 fascinating thinking about the way that this is working out right now. I And K-State's schedule is weird from the standpoint of some teams that they've played have turned out to maybe not be as good as you would have thought, but – uh, and there are certainly some others down the stretch, like KU is not as good as you thought. Now, given the the magnitude that that game will possess for both teams, I don't know that the record will matter all that much in it. Um, you think about West Virginia, probably about what we expected at this point. But certain teams, obviously BYU being one of them, but Colorado coming up for K-State, those are teams playing better than expected. Yeah, and I will say this, part of why people said that – this was the year that Kansas State had to strike was that they had basically the tough games at home and the more manageable ones on the road. That was the, I think that was the logic, right? That this was a schedule more conducive to competing for a Big 12 championship rather than next year. Maybe it still works out that way, but Oklahoma State and Arizona were at home and BYU and Colorado were on the road. Do we still feel that way about that those pair of home games and that pair of road games, I I don't know. Yeah. And, and obviously and, Arizona wasn't a league game. I get that. And, and K-State is, is also in a spot where I, I think if you look at their schedule right now, there is probably overall, at least with what's left, been a bump up in terms of the competition that they will face. Because I, I think that there are still some teams, well, yes, there's some underachieving going on. Um I don't know that we can fully start to penalize Oklahoma State for, even though it was a backup quarterback for Utah and everything else, for losses to K-State and in Utah. Um, but like BYU being better than anticipated, and I don't even know if that's like right to say because, again, I, I think over the course of the season, I would still expect it to play out that K-State is far better than BYU. That was just a, a, a fluky game where K-State's flaws also amplified the flukes. Yes. And another thing I pointed out is why they thought everyone said the schedule was more conducive this year was you get your tough games at home and your more manageable games on the road, which is a little murky now because they had to play BYU in that setting. And now they have to play Colorado in this setting and they still have to go to Iowa state. Right. So the, the, that's kind of not working itself out. Oklahoma state doesn't look as great. Another reason why, because everyone said, well, they get to play the worst four teams in the Big 12, Arizona State, Cincinnati, Houston, and BYU. We could say what we want about BYU, but they're not one of the four worst teams in the Big 12. We know that. Yeah. We could say what we want about Arizona State, and I know that the opinion there is kind of polarizing, but I don't think they're one of the four worst teams in the Big 12. Cincinnati, maybe they are, but boy, I think Cincinnati is better than I thought they were because – they at least have a much better quarterback than they did a season ago. Now, Houston's still one of the first four, worst four yeah. teams. But, like, I would say also one of the four worst teams is probably TCU and Baylor in case State doesn't play those two. Yeah, that's that's where you, you look up and down this thing, where more times than not, the teams that are, are worse than what was anticipated 
Um, K State is is not going to get to see this year. Um, TCU being one of them, they seem very down. You're not going to get UCF. You're not going to get um, some of the Baylor, like you mentioned. I, I think, and you look at some of the others, like the, the scheduling will be interesting. And in some ways, maybe this is a little backwards to think of it like this, but do you think it would have been better for K State, similar to last season, get your easier games at home and have the tougher ones on the road and maybe it helps you stay locked in a little bit more. Like you think about what they did last season in that setting. Like, yeah, they had the one they dropped to Oklahoma state where they really struggled, but they had a chance at the end. They went to overtime at Texas and then they just took care of the, the schools that I would say are BYU adjacent or worse last season when they played them at home. I guess, but I, I don't know that that's the way it's worked out. I think they're getting like at least moderately good teams on the road. And I think that's part. And I don't, don't know. We'll see how it matures. But I don't know if this Kansas State team is really constructed as of now to be a good team on the road, right? I think that's one of the reasons they dropped it in the fashion that they did at BYU because of all that youth and experience, especially on the offensive side of the ball. I'll put it this way, like last year, and and it's like back-to-back -back years where it's like, man, these road games are so tricky because you get BYU in a very tricky spot, and maybe they're better than we thought. You get Colorado in a really tricky spot, and they're maybe they're better than we thought what they were. Last year, you went at Oklahoma State. We didn't think much of them at the time, but then they end up playing for a Big 12 title. They, they made it to Arlington. You played at Missouri, and you lost by a 61-yard field goal, and they end up playing and winning the Cotton Bowl. You play at Texas, and they made it to the college football playoff. Like, yeah, K-State's kind of struggled on the road, and a lot of them have been tight games outside of BYU. But boy, the, I mean, the, the teams that are playing on the road are pretty freaking good, too, like in, in their own right. Even, and we'll see what happens, but Tulane has actually looked like a buzzsaw in the last few weeks. They look like they're going to tear through the AAC. Am I not wrong about that? Yeah, no, that's no, yeah. I I get that. I I think number one, road games are difficult if you are you don't have a wide talent gap between your opponents, which is what we're seeing or, in the Big Twelve this year. Experience, yeah, yeah, or or, or the experience. Uh, and I would, I, I would rather play at TCU and Baylor than I would BYU and Colorado. Yeah, no, oh, absolutely, yeah. It was, so, I mean, and you think about it too, school. like. Now, I don't know if you picked those two on purpose or not, but like you think about um, BYU obviously has a very well-connected and fired up fan base. I don't know that anybody would ever say that about TCU and Baylor where they're smaller fan bases that like those aren't intimidating places to go. Um, I, I've never felt that way in my time there. Colorado is juice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and so that's where, like, yeah, you're you're missing out on on that uh in, in certain circumstances, which I guess can kind of take us into this with Colorado on the horizon. This is a game that has changed in the way that you thought it might go because Colorado has looked a little bit more well put together and better than anticipated. Um, how I mean, how worried should K-State be about dropping this game? And honestly, you drop this one, then you're asking the team to rip off what six straight wins in the regular season. Uh, if you you still want to get to Arlington, because I think seven and two is going to get you there based on how this league is working. Um, and and winning six straight, including one of those having to be at Iowa State, seems like a tricky thing to do. It is a tricky thing to do. Um, I, absolutely. What I will say is, I think there's going to be a three loss team in in Arlington. I think there's too much cannibalism that's about to happen um, inside the league. Now, maybe someone gets in there with a loss or two. Um, but I, I don't think there's going to be two teams with two losses or less. I just don't see that at this point. Uh, I am I will say this, and this is kind of a blanket statement, and people can roll their eyes all they want. Until the youth and inexperience proves me wrong and wins a significant game on the road, because I, I think that's what hurt them at BYU. I, like until they can prove me that they kind of overcame that hurdle, I think this becomes a problematic game for Kansas State. Now maybe they learn from BYU and they and then they just take care of business here, and that's possible. But 
you know, spoiler, I'll probably take the Buffaloes because I need to see this group win a significant road game before I give them the blind faith to do so. Yeah, I mean, that's uh, that's the scary thing here is that you're facing this Colorado team that they're better than anticipated in, in a few areas. And the the number one spot where Colorado can probably beat you has really proven to be K-State's biggest weakness so far this year. Where coming out of that Oklahoma State game, I think people still look around and say, I thought the secondary was supposed to be pretty good, and they've been the the biggest concern uh, on this team. Once you get past, you know, Avery Johnson still kind of having to learn and get through just some of the younger struggles, which I think he's he's broken through for the most part, and I think the offense is is in good shape. It's, I mean, how are you going to handle Shadur Sanders rocketing the ball all over the place to you to different playmakers, including Travis Hunter? Two things. You just mentioned Travis Hunter, and that'll be my first one. You, you might be playing the best player in college football. And I say might because some people would argue that. I think he's the best player in college football. And, like, the kinds of plays he makes in the moment he does not only makes him the best player in college football to me, he's one of the more clutch ones too. Like, And you can't throw on him. He is a turnover, forced turnover machine. I mean – I get that they had the Hail Mary that wasn't him. That was Shador to, I think, with LeJonte Wester, I want to say. Um, if I Hopefully I get the name right. But Shador Sanders knocking that fumble out in the – I mean, that's amazing. Like, those are the types of clutch plays that don't often happen in football, like doing it in that manner. He's different. That's kind of why I kind of like Colorado a lot more than I did last year. Last year, if you go back and look – we all made fun of them, and they were the butt of everyone's joke, including ours. But they lost – most of their losses were razor-thin margins. And this year, they are they have that impressive win over UCF, obviously, where it wasn't a razor-thin margin, and they got kind of their doors blown off before settling in at Nebraska. But in a close game, despite the ineptitude sometimes of Deion Sanders' in-game coaching, this team scares me because their playmakers are coming up big in some of the bigger moments – and I think that's significant. The second thing is, you know, glass half full, glass half empty. I'll go back and forth here, just giving you both ways to look at this thing. There is also a scenario in a universe where that bust out performance, breakout performance by Avery Johnson at home against Oklahoma State is a sign of things to come and perhaps a launching point for him this season too. Yeah, that's uh, that's a good that's a good positive to talk about there. I would also say you know, while going on the road and, and Colorado taking care of business against any opponent should be a credit to them given how they played last season. Um, but UCF is one of those teams that we've talked about is appearing to be far worse than anticipated going into this. But you're, yeah. they're going to go home. It's, it will be, I'm sure, uh, a nice environment. Another late kickoff for K-State on the road. And, I mean, think about where Chris Kleiman has, has won road games. Uh, in his career, in in, in non COVID year situations, because he did win in Fort Worth in 2020, but you think about the places where he's been able to kind of go and get victories. 2019, the I Starkville, 20, yeah, start they did win Starkville in 2019. Uh, essentially, uh, that was maybe it was a little before, but later on that year, Joe Moorhead did get fired. So uh, Malik, I guess Malik that's Malik that's Malik where. Malik yeah, that that was the uh, start of the Grim Reaper, town. Chris Kleiman. They he won in Morgantown in 2022, won in Waco in 2022, uh, has won in Lubbock every time he's been down there. That's been the <laughs> Lubbock and Lawrence have been the easiest places for Chris Kleiman to go and get victories. Beat, but beat Ames by a point. Uh, and I should also say Norman. Uh, he made those he made those pretty easy. But there have been obviously, like most, more road losses than there have been the road victories. Um, and it feels like for whatever reason, some of these games, they, they just give them more trouble than they should. And I, now some of that isn't totally fair because you think about like um, the 2022 team, they only lost one road game. And if Will Howard doesn't get hurt, they probably win that game. So it's, you know, I'm, I'm not dinging him for that. Um, well, but like Oklahoma, everybody, everybody those, got injured that game. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but like, got injured too. Yeah, the losses in Stillwater uh, have have been 
most of those coming at night and just not great situations for kids. Nobody State. wins in Stillwater, really. Um, and, and then obviously the BYU thing and some of the struggles that have come up from that. And it, it, you do wonder, are they going to be equipped to handle this? Because I think, and I don't think this is a, a tr- true, like on the coaching staff problem. I think this is just a trying to figure out how to get something worked out for any team. But the process of these road teams having to go and sit in a hotel all day waiting around for hours and hours and hours to actually go and then play a road game. I think that's, I think that's really tricky. And I think that this Colorado game is going to come down to it for K state trying to right their wrongs from the game against BYU, where the defense came out and gave the offense the opportunity to put that game away early. And the offense did almost everything they needed to, to do so outside of putting the ball in the end zone because they kept committing penalties. And then eventually DJ Giddens started the avalanche with a very uncharacteristic play that probably won't ever happen again. And it started this avalanche because it was Avery Johnson's first, you know, P P four road start that he was getting in. And that makes for a different beast. Um, That's probably outside of, you know, uh, it's in the group of probably the still waters of the world to have that be one of the tougher places to make your first career road start. And it kind of ate him alive there for a little bit. So I think that this is where K-State's just going to have to come out and prove themselves to that they can fix those problems. Because if they do, I think they should still be able to win this game. Like, they're better in a lot more areas than Colorado. Colorado has the high-end talent that K-State doesn't. But K-State's got more of the talent in that tier just behind them. They're obviously the better coach team. And they're going to be able, you would hope, to kind of assert themselves on the line because we know that's where Colorado has their biggest struggle. Um, so it, it, this is a game that it's far more concerning as we sit here at the start of October than I ever thought it was going to be this season because Colorado, credit to them, looks like a much more real player this year. Like, hey, this is a team that could win eight games right now as Colorado sits. Yeah, Kansas State's the more established program, probably, well, not probably, definitely has more continuity and culture and, and winning ways. But, I'm, yeah, I'll, I kind of have to see it to believe it still, to to, to kind of know or have faith that this roster is ready to win these types of games on the road because that's going to be – it's going to be a challenge. And as you said, Colorado is playing up to a level at the moment – to where they are dangerous enough to catch Kansas State and make them uncomfortable in Boulder. So that's where I am. The second thing is, and you got into a little bit of this, the late night stuff, and and there's probably nothing to be done here because uh, I guess every power league outside of the SEC is going to have to deal with it in some way. And there's probably not going to be any modifications to it because it's really controlled by TV and TV kind of pays your bills. So you kind of do what they say, but we're, we're approaching a situation now too, that the realignment for the ACC for the big 10 and the big 12 is going to make for some complicated and problematic spots just based on travel and kickoff times and stuff of that ilk. And I'm not just saying because you got to play BYU at night in front of that crowd. And I'm not just saying because you have to play Colorado at night in front of that crowd. Although those games become tougher because of that environment, it's the fact that you play at BYU at, what, 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock local time. You get out of there and you don't don't get back to Manhattan until 4 or 5 in the morning when some of your players and coaches have not slept at 4 or 5 in the morning. It becomes a very shortened and, sh- and shrunken week, maybe compared to your opponent. And then you have to play at 11 a.m. on a Saturday, making it far shorter because you don't get those extra windows. So you're short on prep, but significantly probably mattering more. So you're also sick, you're a lot shorter on recovery and maybe a little bit of practice time because you do have some time there that gets lost. And now Kansas State's going to have to deal with the second one of those. Not because they have we they have to play at eleven a.m. Um, I don't think we know that time yet, but you're playing at that same time slot in the Mountain Time Zone, going to get back from your charter, 
at 5 a.m. or so, basically on little to no sleep. So you got to use Sunday basically to catch up on that and and kind of. But then it's not a home game; it's a road yeah. game. So it becomes shorter because of that. Because instead of getting that Friday, no, that Friday becomes now a travel day because you got to go to West Virginia. Now those things, I think, is probably something that at least once or twice maybe everyone will run into. Although I think it's pretty unique this time because Kansas State is one of the few schools probably playing in two of those games on the road and then having to follow it up with a road game. Well, so this is we we've talked about this stretch since the schedule came out. This is a this is a a test for K State because the number one, you're playing three of four Big 12 games to start the season on the road. You had to go to a different time zone, BYU. You got you got put in that late kickoff window like could happen. So you kicked off at 9.30 Central Time, 8.30. Then you come back home. You play O-State at 11. Fortunately, you get a bye week to prepare for Colorado. But again, you're going back to the mountain time zone. You're kicking off at 9.15 local time now. And then, like we talked about, and this is a specific stretch where if you're trying to find trouble in K-State's schedule this year, it was the fact that you have to go and play a game at Colorado like you're saying, you're going to get back early in the morning on Sunday. That might bang out a day for you that you can't really use how you want to or need to. And then you're not at home that following week. You have to get on a plane and make your, your, longest your here. yes, you have to go to Morgantown, West Virginia. You have to leave on Friday. You have to fly into somewhere. You have to get on a bus and drive then to Morgantown. It this is you know you know what really could make that is if that game's at 11 a.m. Yeah. And it very well could be, um, depending on how it all plays out. I would say, look, this every every league that's realigned like this is going to have to deal with it. The SEC is the only one that isn't. Uh, but like Miami this week, it's going to be fascinating to see Miami going to Cal and kicking off at 1030 Eastern uh, against Cal, who's a team that's got a little bit of life to them. So like everybody is having to find a way to deal with this. Uh, really, the unfortunate nature of it is, is that K-State has been saddled with two of these late as late as possible kicks as you can get. We'll see how they respond from it. We'll talk about it more next week when we have the actual game preview for you, and I'm sure Chris Kleiman will uh, get to discuss it next week as well. All right, best bets time. We do this each and every week and preparing for everything else going on. Here is a recap of last week. Ladies and gentlemen, shield your eyes if you're allergic to the color green because it was a monstrous week. You should have parlayed it. Yeah, Oops. all six of them just line them up right there. Uh, get aggressive. BYU wins at Baylor. OU covers Arizona. They went out right. Like I said, you, might happen. You, you got. I'll, I'll say this: like you got pretty lucky on the Oklahoma one. I did. Yes, I got very lucky on the Oklahoma one. Um, but hey, we're not going to talk about luck. We're going to talk about skill. Texas Tech, uh, Colorado, and T- and Josh Hoover. Tech was against uh, Cincinnati. So that one was a pr- it was it was fine. I don't think I had a I don't think I had a lucky one in there. I mean, there. Cincinnati oh. did miss a field goal to force overtime there at the end. Okay, so, yeah. So maybe yeah. I did get a little lucky there. But, yeah, but Colorado you know, and Josh Hoover cruised. Yeah. If honestly, if you had lost the Tech one at at one point, it went from luck to where it would have turned into a bad beat for you and back. So I don't know. Colorado was easy. Josh Hoover easy as well. Also, you're like, man, that graphic looks disgusting. That's because. Some idiot forgot to save the Photoshop uh, in the proper way last week, so I had to I had to do stuff I didn't want to do, and uh, that's why it looks ugly. So let's look at the pretty ones and our picks for this week. Uh, I am taking Mizzou money line at Texas A and M. I don't know. I think Missouri, Missouri's not as good as they were last year, but yeah. well, Texas A and M has not looked like a good team to me at any point, and it's I think Mizzou's. Yeah, it's in College Station. Who That's cares? That's why I would take a Nah, overrated. Who cares? <laughs> uh, give me the Tigers. And then Tennessee, they're at Arkansas, minus 13 and a half. Arkansas sucks. Um, Tennessee's a wagon. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, I mean, t- Arkansas, not as good as Oklahoma. Tennessee was, what, a nine-and-a-half point favorite there. They covered that. They were able to win, I think, just by 10. And, I mean, again, Arkansas far inferior to that Oklahoma defense. And then my last one, I'm going like you last week with Hoover – Give me Noah Fafita over 275 and a half passing yards against Texas Tech because in the first two conference games of the year, both Sam Levitt and then Brendan Soresby last week have gone over that number in passing 
against Texas Tech, including Soresby, who threw for over 400 yards last week. Yeah, no, I, I like it. Game script should be pretty kind to that one as well. I will say I didn't take that specific one, like real money here, but I have three different like Arizona team total bets this week. So we're kind of on the same page in that thinking. I didn't go over for the game because Tech scares me a little bit. But, yeah. but if Tech – if Tech plays a good game, they can win, though. That's that's the interesting thing. That that's kind of an intriguing game to me. I'm sure we'll get into that a little bit later. I, I would, what do they say? Bet the farm. I would bet the farm on Louisville six and a half. Like Louisville could have easily beat Notre Dame. That they, they had some things not really go their way. I think that's a really good team, and SMU is not. Uh, that's basically as simple as that. If Louisville doesn't beat SMU by a touchdown, I'd be pretty shocked. I think Louisville can still win the ACC. Penn State, uh, have you seen UCLA's defense? It's it's not good, folks. Uh, I love that bet as well because I think that Penn State offense is also only going to get better. The only thing that scares me a little bit there is game script because UCLA could just be getting the doors blown off of them. And Penn State has kind of gone slow. You know, Indy Cotter Nicky is not a high-paced coordinator, but if they're efficient, I think they're going to score more than the 34 point, 34 and a half points listed there. West Virginia, Oklahoma State, that's a big number, folks. 65 and a half points between those two. Yeah, they're not really great defenses, but both really want to run the ball. That could be a fast game. Like, I mean, fast game as in it could be over quick because neither team wants to throw it. Yeah, good point. No, yeah, nobody's going to want to chuck it around. I, 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 I like the Louisville call. Uh, I'm, I'm with you there. Penn State, yep. Uh, and then – Oklahoma State, West Virginia is going to be a fascinating watch to me. There, there are a lot of games in the Big 12 this week, and we can just get into the to the Big 12 side of things right now because this is a week where I think I have an idea of how things will play out, but it's not a certainty, and I think all of these games have some fascination to them, or at least most of them. There are some there are some pretty boring ones that probably aren't worth your time unless something happens um the first of those being houston at tcu which thank goodness is a friday night game um so nobody <laughs> pay any attention to this one tcu is a 16 and a half point favorite at home against houston this is a game that quite literally matters for no reason unless like sunny dykes needs to get a win to prop himself up and try to make get tcu to six wins this year but Nobody cares. This has zero bearing on how the rest of the Big 12 will live life over the next two months. Houston hasn't scored a touchdown in like nine or ten quarters, I believe. Um, they they really are struggling on the offensive side of the ball. But TCU's really bad on defense. <laughs> so yeah. Like it's it's so I think Houston's finally going to get some points up. And Donovan that, Smith is due for one of those weird breakout games that he it, has occasionally. I, yeah, I was going to say, it would not shock me. I would be a little shocked if Houston won. Maybe not even tremendously shocked. But it would not shock me if Houston covered. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm with you on that one. This that, It's a game, you probably have a problem if you're, uh, if you're really laying down something special on I, this it, one. The only interesting to lay might be the like, Houston team total over. Because I bet it's really, really low, and TCU yeah. gives up points to everybody. Yeah. Uh, first game on Saturday, late start for the Big 12. 3 o'clock is the earliest Saturday Big 12 game. Oklahoma State, a field goal favorite at home against West Virginia. This is one of those fascinating ones that I really don't know what to tell you is going to happen. I mean, Alan Bowman may not play all that long. Does Ollie Gordon break out? Probably not because it appears that he's you know asleep at the wheel this year. And West Virginia, I think they're at least going to believe that they're a scrappy team and that they're better than they actually are. So um, this will be this will be fascinating. And what it was a couple of years ago, I think the last West Virginia trip there, West Virginia went to Stillwater and won in the rain. I think Nicolosi started that game at quarterback. Uh, so I'll be interested to see how this one plays out because whoever loses this game, shut the season down. Uh, you can join Houston and TCU in the category of. We do not care about you. You do not matter the rest of the way in the Big 12. I would agree with that. I think West Virginia is actually the better team, and I'm surprised to be saying that. Now, being the better team and winning in Stillwater is a different beast, but I would have them covering. That line actually started, I think, at six, and it's all the way down to three, too. So a lot of people are thinking the same thing. So, of course, Mike Daniel will probably come out and just blow the doors 
off the Mountaineers or something like that. Uh, but I, I would be tempted to go West Virginia here. Yeah, I think they I'm, can win out right. I think I think they can too. I, I would not shut that down. Uh, three and a half le- hours later, kicking off in Ames, Iowa. Tim Brando on the call. So she I was thinking it's love him, apparently. Yeah. Oh boy. When I got that's that, a marriage, me, that's that's a marriage that makes sense though. Yes. No, exactly. That I I got that that there was a tweet sent out today by uh someone on the Iowa State line of thinking, and uh they were saying, let me find the exact quote here. Uh Tim Brando is part of the elite announcer club. Uh and then I said that's such an Iowa State take, and I had to send it to uh, more of the K State faction that I'm around when I saw that one. Uh, yeah, Tim Brando on this game. It makes a lot of sense. It's quite annoying. Uh, I will not be watching this game unless Sawyer Robertson is leading a game winning drive towards the end. Also, the Royals are going to be playing the Yankees during this time. So <laughs> screw off football on Saturday. Football is going to be interesting on Saturday. You kind of alluded to it. It's not just the Big 12, but I think it's like across the, the gamut. where Nasty there, weekend. There is a ton of games basically after 3 o'clock and even a lot more even after 6. There is not a whole lot of early games in college football this week. The it, you know Every week on 3, we'll put out the graphic about uh, the games, the, the week 6 matchups, the featured ones. Here, here's what was on the graphic card this week. Uh, the very top one, 11 a.m., ABC, Mizzou at Texas A&M. Actually a top 25 matchup. The only matchup between top 25 teams this week. So, obviously, the rest of the card is going to look a little gross. I get that. <laughs> but I think that's also setting up for this to maybe be upset Saturday. Yeah, a couple Friday games. Michigan State at Oregon. Syracuse at UNLV, also in the top 25. And then Saturday, Iowa at Ohio State. Auburn at Georgia, Clemson at, at Florida State, Tennessee at Arkansas, Michigan at Wisconsin, and then the next game we'll talk about UCF at Florida and Miami at Cal. UCF Florida is one that I will be interested in because this is kind of UCF's last grab at, at saving this season and turning it around and making it something that doesn't translate to Gus Malzahn being a fraud and UCF fans probably being – highly annoyed by how he's coached the last couple of seasons. I think UCF has to win this game. And I would pick Florida because I think Florida is throwing the ball well enough to really score some points on UCF. And they have just enough defense to keep UCF down, in my opinion. Now, UCF really wants to run the ball. I get that. And when they can't, they suck. So put it that way. Yeah. Like they, they couldn't run the ball last week on Colorado, which was, you know, amazing to see because we don't expect that from the Buffaloes. So when they can't run the ball, they're in trouble. Gus Malzahn, even at Auburn, he had trouble producing passing offenses outside of maybe a special year here and there. Florida, if you're going to go into that game kind of being one-dimensional, I think Florida's, they're not anything to write home about. I get that, but they got the dudes up front to at least take away your run game enough. Yeah. Yep. That The athletes are still there for Florida. Uh, and that would that would be the thing to kind of concern you. All right, uh, final two games in the Big 12 this weekend, a night kick in Tempe. Arizona State, two-and-a-half-point favorites against KU. Uh, this is going to be a fascinating one as well. It is. Because, I mean, this is – if KU loses this game, they are one and five, and it puts reaching a bowl game into serious jeopardy for them. I mean, it's already – in that situation but if you lose this one to a team that while yes better than anticipated this year again team on k-state schedule that's better than we thought they would be um it, it i mean you're 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 going up upstream and it's not looking good for you um and i you know ku i think the last couple of weeks a lot of people have still given them some some benefit of the doubt but i think it's gone at this point i think a lot of people are probably going to go arizona state this week and i think i will yeah, I mean, I had KU 14th, excuse me, 14th in the Big 12 power ranking. So obviously, I kind of jumped off that bandwagon. I think I had him at 15. Yeah, uh, you did. Yep. Fan and I had 14. You and Drew had him at 15. Uh, That's real specific. quick, I don't want to expose Drew while he can't defend himself. He did. He wanted to, to pop the boys real quick on KSO. He had KU 16 in the initial list he sent me. And then I think he was like, I can't be that much of a hater. Uh, can you flip? 
uh, Houston and KU. I was like, yeah, I can do that for you. Yeah, I, I would have probably been like, dude, they're not worth it. Houston, come on. No, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, no, come on. They're not. Let's be real here. What I will say this, one, and you're right up in it, kind of opened my, my eyes and you were right. After a while, if you keep losing the same way, it's a trend yep. for a reason, and it's probably not going to to stop like i get that but there's another school of thought where it's like if you keep coming down to these final game the final minutes of these games at some point it's going to shake out right and look i i i've said it all along i like the way arizona state's playing but that worm is about to turn too because they're a team that's going to get worse as the year goes on in my opinion because they don't have the depth i've said that for a while and no offense to Tempe and Sun Devil Stadium. I'm sure that's where they still play, I'm guessing. But it's not exactly a firecracker or a gauntlet that KU's about to walk into. I, If you're going to give me – It's a hellhole. <laughs> it's a dump. If you're going to give me two and a half points with Kansas, I would still probably take it and just not feel good about doing it, though. Yeah, that it- – it, this it's it's going to be a good game to to kind of see yeah. and feel out what these teams are. Another game that's big for both teams to try and determine what they'll be the rest this of the year. It's going to be the most fun game of the day. Arizona oh. Texas Tech late kickoff for everybody. So uh, this is ten o'clock on Fox Central Time. So even later than K State BYU or Arizona Utah last week. Strap in everybody. Ten o'clock. Uh, late one to see Arizona, who's a six and a half point favorite at home against the Red Raiders. How do you feel about this? Well, I, the only thing I'm confident on is that there will be a lot of points. I think Arizona takes care of business here. I don't think Texas Tech is all that good still. I, you know, cool you beat Cincinnati. Uh, cool you also by a field goal at home, by the way. And also Arizona State, you had a lot of fortuitous things kind of go your way to also win that game by one score going on the road at Arizona, who's probably feeling like they got some of their mojo back after last week. Um, I don't think this goes well for Texas tech. It could, it could be close and they could win it. But you know, if I'm going through the simulations in my head, a lot more of them spit out Arizona winning this game by two scores than they do Texas tech winning this game. I would take Arizona to win because they are the home team. But their win over Utah might not be all that impressive considering what the Utes didn't have. And they probably feel really, really good about themselves. That That's a kind of win because they know what they just did that can kind of linger a little bit too long. As you just kind of laid out, Yeah. one thing that's true about Texas Tech this year is that like every game is bound to be a close game. So yes. I think it's a close win for Arizona. All right. We'll see how it plays out, Uh, and that will do it for us on this Friday. The Sunday crew will be back again in a couple days, recap the Big 12 weekend, get a little bit more in-depth on K-State getting ready for Colorado next week, and then a normal game week starts up on Monday as the Cats prepare to go to Boulder for the first time in well over a decade as the Buffaloes are officially back in the Big 12. Uh, Will be just kind of a cool thing to experience and see K-State, Colorado, conference mates once again so that will do it for us today for Derek young i'm mason vo thanks for watching and listening to the kso show if you want more on the cats even throughout this bye week go to on three find kstateonline.com and we'll have you covered there